my belief is that our guides and angels and the divine can't help us if we do not ask for help, if we're not willing to ask for help and receive the help, because this is a free will planet. We can choose to just nose to the grindstone. I'm going to stumble through life and be so independent and do the best I can. And I'm never going to ask for help or receive help. We can choose to do that. I mean, it's, it's a very instructive choice, but it's not going to be um, easy or fun. And you're not going to, my opinion, you're, you're not likely to be able to really live your purpose and, and do what you came here to do if you're going to be in that place. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, President of Spiritual Awakenings International. Welcome to our Spiritual Awakenings International Presents. We're glad to have you here. We love to know where everybody's joining us from. So if you can take a minute now and please type into the chat where you're joining us from today. Spiritual Awakenings International is in 75 countries around the world. We're absolutely delighted about that. I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada. Our speaker today, Wendy Rose Williams, is joining you from just outside of Seattle in Washington State, USA. And uh, we'd love to hear where you're all joining us from. Uh, but right now, I'm going to turn it over to the Vice President of Spiritual Awakenings International, Robert Baer, who is going to be introducing our speaker. Robert. Thank you, Dr. Kaysan. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We have a great presentation today. Wendy Rose Williams has had two near-death experiences while pregnant. She met her angels while home alone when an aorta uh, artery ruptured and again the night before surgery. The soulmate she contracted with to wake up her spiritually introduced her to Newton's journey of souls and past life regression. These events triggered a profound spiritual awakening to resolve 21 shared lives with that soulmate. The remarkable difference in Wendy's quality of life inspired her to help others live a happier, healthier life by releasing their chronic pain, anxiety, and depression. Wendy became a certified spiritual teacher and reiki master, energy healer, as well as a hypnotherapist. She co-hosts the Waking Up Spiritually podcast with 50 episodes archived at wakingupspiritually.com and is publishing her third book, Regression Healing. Joe and Marilyn, Wendy's books are available on Amazon, on Amazon and Audible. You may request a complimentary 15-minute phone appointment with her at wendyrosewilliams.com. And without further ado, Wendy, thanks for... Well, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction and for having me today. I'm just so excited to get to be with everyone and talk about my favorite subject, <laughs> our past life and past life energy and archetypes. So let me share my screen with you here. So let's talk about past life mastery through archetypes, because there are powerful archetypes. And we all have many, many types of uh, past lives that we choose to take on, because my belief is our soul just craves experiences in order to be able to progress. And whether it is colonial America, or whether it's a life as a ruler, uh, whether it's a life as a creative or as a rebel, there just is so much uh, energy in these different, different areas. So first, let's back up a little bit and share with you uh, my spiritual awakening. It came about um, through the, the two uh, near-death experiences was the start of it, as Robert mentioned. So back in 1997, I was a uh, married um, mother of one, and we'd had a journey with infertility. So we were over the moon that I was pregnant for actually the fourth time. I'd also lost to uh, via ectopic pregnancies. And so we are very, very excited, uh, having made it through that, that battle with infertility also. 
And what happened in August of 1997, I go have that first visit with the OBGYN. I'm only 10 weeks pregnant. Everything's looking great, according to the doctor. But two things didn't seem right to me. And you've just got to pay attention to your intuition. Uh, so I kept having this recurring dream. And I did not understand the concept of precognitive dreams, that we can actually be having prophetic dreams that are trying to warn us about something that may be coming up that may be an issue. But I did not understand this dream that I was having almost every night. And it was the same dream. And there'd be this terrible uh, storm out at sea. And I would see uh, all these winches and cleats and just everything tearing off the boat in this violent storm the mass would break off, the ship would always break in two, and the ship would go down. Now, you don't need a, a very uh, experienced dream interpreter to tell you, Wendy, pay attention. <laughs> Your ship's about to go down. There was, there was a health crisis coming. The other thing I was noticing was just some significant um, heartburn. And I'd call the doctor's office several times to say, hey, I'm only 10 weeks pregnant. What is this, this incredible heartburn? And they said, just, you know, take my Lanta, that's safe, certainly call if you continue to be concerned. So that kind of sets the stage to what's going on. I'm working at home, I'm alone. My husband's at work, he's got one car, it's a weekday, and our nanny is at the park with our little 18-month-old uh, toddler. She's got the other car. I just cannot get comfortable that day. I don't know what's happening. I tr I'm trying to work, but then it's like, ugh, just this this discomfort, this feeling of unease that just kept growing. So this goes on and on. And I finally just run into the bathroom thinking I'm going to be sick. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I felt this searing pain. I looked down at my abdomen thinking literally someone just stuck a knife in me. And it felt like an organ burst was the only way I can, I can describe it. And just before it happened, I felt this sense of impending doom. And I have never felt that before. I didn't know very much about NDEs at all. Because again, this was 1997. And they're not, there had not been as much popular press, uh, press about them. And IAN certainly existed, the International Association of Near-Death Studies. But I knew nothing about it. So... I pass out um, in the bathroom, I am home alone, I am passed out cold on the floor. And I really believe I only woke up because of divine intervention, because I did cry out for help as, as I was going down. And when I came to, I was disoriented, I'm laying on my side on the bathroom floor, just clutching my abdomen, and the whole room was lit up. I have never seen so much light. It was just magnificent. And I saw, to my amazement, four or five very large figures that I can only describe as angels. And they were uh, floating a few uh, inches off the floor. And one of them spoke to me and was straight to the point. And he said, Wendy, you've got to call for help now or you're going to go home. And I knew exactly what he meant, that I was going to die. So I just tried to put my <laughs> amazement aside because I knew there wasn't time to be trying to figure out what was going on. I just needed to accept my bathroom is filled with angels and they're trying to help me. So let's just let's just listen and, and receive this help with the most utmost gratitude. And my answer to him was, I understand, but I can't walk. And what he said to me was very telling. And he said, you just have to be willing to try. And I think in hindsight that that was about free will, because we can receive so much assistance if we're just willing to ask for it and to then listen and act on it timely. So I tried to get up on my hands and knees. I was able to do that. I could not, I could not stand up. But at the point I got to my hands and knees, it was like being gently lifted. And I felt like I was being 
flown or assisted the short distance to get to the landline. Because again, it was 1997, you know, didn't, didn't have the, the cell phone uh, glued to the hand or, or glued in the back pocket like we do now. So I'm there um, on the floor, uh, trying to reach up for the, the bedroom phone. And I, I get the phone and I did think for a second, gosh, who do I call? The angel just said, call for help. So I decided to call my husband at work. And there the miracles continued because I got him on the phone immediately. I have never reached him at work like that. And all I said was, can you drive me to the hospital right now? Something's really wrong. I'm in extreme pain. I need to get to the hospital right now. And I give him a lot of credit because he didn't ask me a single question. All he said was, be right there. And I could hear him just throw the phone down. And I knew he was only five minutes away. So I just have time to call the OBGYN office, tell them what's happening. And they said, that's great that you're on your way. When you get here, don't park the car. Don't try and walk. We're going to meet you curbside with a wheelchair. So I knew they were uh, obviously very concerned too. So that's exactly what happened. I get whisked up to the OBGYN office. Again, perfect divine intervention, the OB is located at the hospital. And my local hospital delivered about 5,000 babies a year. And that was very important because that means they have then got a big structure also for GYN emergencies and for other things because they're doing um, so many, so many births and caring for so many pregnant women. So I'm whisked into the ultrasound room and the ultrasound technician, she's working to get a good clear picture. All I can see on the screen is black. And I'd had ultrasounds before. I knew we should be, you know, seeing fine detail. And I looked at her and I said, is your machine working? Is that machine on? I, I don't understand. And she just, I kind of saw her put her game face on and she just touched me on the shoulder and said, I'll be right back with the doctor. So I look at my husband and again, we're like, this is not good. And she comes right back. She has a physician with her as well as a certified nurse midwife. So picture the five of us all trying to squeeze into this tiny ultrasound room. Um, the doctor works with the machine for a moment and he realizes what's going on. And he says, Wendy, we need to admit you right now. You're having a massive abdominal bleed. That's why we can't see anything on the screen. The, the, the machine is fine. The, the issue is there's some major bleed going on. You're seeing blood. That's what all that black is. And that explained why my abdomen was distending so much. Because uh, I'm only 10 weeks pregnant. So again, you know, it's just this tiny little peanut. And there's there's nothing, nothing, um, you know, nothing showing, but I can really see and feel my abdomen distending. So they whisk me up onto the floors. I get admitted straight into a bed and I'm told you cannot get out of bed even to go to the bathroom. You're gonna to have to call for a nurse assist for a bedpan. We just need you laying prone until we figure out what's going on here. They are calling for blood. A nurse is calling for, uh, she's calling the Puget Sound Blood Bank. We have a central blood bank out here um, in Seattle to not waste that very precious resource. She asks me my blood type and I know it. I think everyone should know their blood type and also get one of the free apps in case of medical emergency and have it on your phone. And that way, if you're ever in a situation where you can't speak for yourself or you're just not tracking well, medical personnel will know exactly what your most pertinent medical history is because they can pull up without knowing your phone code, the in case of medical emergency information. So you put your um, any allergies in there and you put your most pertinent things in there. So I, I had told her a negative. She's calling, trying to get blood because I absolutely needed to have transfusions start. And the nurse comes back in the room. Here's another surprise. And she says, I can't get any blood for her because there was this major train collision three days ago in Seattle and it's used up all the A negative blood. There is none available in the system. So the physician had been trying to decide, do we go straight to surgery? But now we know we've got no blood. So that's even um, making less sense to do. So we decide to wait and watch and keep calling different places, keep trying to uh, get some blood hung um, and start transfusing me. 
they were able to get some blood probably about six or eight hours later. Um, so that was good news, but I can see we're going through it at an alarming rate. Also, I knew I was walking between worlds. I knew I was deciding whether to stay or to go because it was so hard to stay conscious. It was so hard to focus even on really important questions being answered. Like the provider would have to get you know right in my face and be gently shaking my shoulder to get me to um, be able to you know focus and connect with them. What concerned me the most was I didn't really care. And that is so not me. I have always just been excited, happy to be here, enthusiastic about life. So that, that really concerned me. So uh, I am then uh, in this situation in the hospital for about three days because we were, were again continuing to transfuse. I am just trying to visualize this healing I'm, I'm going through in my mind. Okay, what are the non-essential organs? Maybe this was my gallbladder. Was this my appendix? Because we just, we don't know um, what it is um, and everyone's agreeing it's probably an organ has burst. Something is, is clearly, clearly going on to have all this, all this blood loss. So what happens next is the hematocrit. Um, they're measuring my hematocrit and other blood tests every day. And the hematocrit is just, it's just gone too low. So it was day three, the physician says to me, Wendy, you're, you're officially bleeding out. We just can't get enough blood transfused quickly enough. You lose it faster than we can pump it in. I need you to agree to surgery. Will you please agree to surgery? So of course I did. I sign all the paperwork. And picture being in your first trimester of pregnancy with this very wanted baby after years of infertility, having lost two to ectopic pregnancies, and I know, uh, you know, this is just not a good situation I've had. I've had all these transfusions. Now we're talking about surgery. I'm just really concerned about the baby um, as well as about myself. And, but I do, I do agree to the surgery. We're going to do it the very next morning at 7 a.m. with my OB and with one of his partners. Uh, we did talk about sending me downtown and it, it just didn't make sense. I said, nope, I'm comfortable here. I know, I know, um, as I said, this being such a maternity hospital, I'm, I'm right where I need to be. So, and I'd also had two previous surgeries with the same surgeon because of the ectopic pregnancies. So we agree, I'm going to stay right where I am in the community hospital. And that night, I get my, my, my dinner. What is it? 4.30 in a hospital. You, you eat your dinner so early. And I'm trying to just relax after dinner. I'm trying to just summon my strength. I'm trying to picture a positive outcome. The moment I picture a positive outcome, I pop right out of my body. I leave my body, look back over my left shoulder, and go, oh my gosh, look at her. She is whiter than the sheets. She looks like a ghost. She's really in a bad way. And then I'm thinking, why am I referring to myself in the third person? Because I hadn't quite worked out that I was in pure soul form. I was my higher self looking at my temporary body of Wendy Rose Williams in the hospital bed. But I was pretty blase about it. I'm like, uh, oh, She's fine, because what much more caught my attention, I can see all this light above me. There's all this white light coming in through the ceiling of my hospital room. So I am just drawn to that. So I go up and up and up and go up to go up to the light. I journey back on home. The minute I get home, I am met by the same angels. I am met by soul family members. And it included all four grandparents, which I thought was wonderful. I knew my mom's parents, my maternal grandparents very well. I loved them. Um, they had passed on, but we'd lived with them. I knew them so well. But what was fascinating, my dad's parents were there too. I've got the paternal grandparents. I never met them because they died before I was born. But again, it's that soul recognition. It doesn't matter about this one lifetime as Wendy. I'd never met my dad's parents. I knew those souls and they knew me. 
So the same angel is the spokesperson. I now recognize it's Archangel Michael, and that's who'd been speaking to me in my bathroom at home, and it helped me get help. And he says, welcome home. We're so glad you're here. You've done nothing wrong. You're absolutely welcome to stay. And feeling that unconditional love, I, it was compelling. It's like my brain is gone. I just like can't think of anything else. I just want to feel more of that. And I just want to explore the white light. I just want to like run ahead. But I realized they were holding me back. They were holding me right at the top of, it was actually an escalator that I took to um, get home because I expressed, I said, I'm too tired to walk through one of those tunnels. If you want me to do that tunnel thing, I'm sorry. I can't do it. I don't have enough energy. And the minute I thought that, this beautiful, pristine escalator came in and took me home. And they were right at the top of the escalator was the way the construct appeared to me. And Michael continues and he says, you're welcome to stay, but if you want to go back, you're going to have to decide quickly. So let me tell you what I can share with you. Number one, if you choose to go back, your surgery tomorrow will be successful. You will fully regain your health. This is huge to know that. Number two, your baby will be born healthy. And remember, I'm only 10 weeks pregnant, so that was a big deal to know that too, especially given um, my uh, challenging um, OB history. So that's the second thing he tells me. So I'm, of course, just like smiling from ear to ear, like, oh, this is starting, you know, the scales are starting to tip of, do I want to go back? And then number three was... We need you to know life is going to be very difficult, likely for many years, because you're not on your life path. So now I'm like, oh my goodness, I just, I felt terrible. I just, so of course the immediate question is, oh my goodness, what can I do? What am I not doing? What do I need, you know, what do I need to change? And because I was 36 years old and to be told I was not on my life path, that really, that really shook me. So I asked him um, for more information and what I should be doing. And he just gently shook his head. So I knew Archangel Michael wasn't going to tell me anymore. So I look around at everyone else thinking, oh, come on, there's like 20 of them here. Someone's got to give. Someone's got to tell me something. And I'm looking around at them all. I'm like listening. I'm trying to like feel or sense or know the information because we've got all our senses and just nothing. So now I'm, I'm really concerned. And this is, again, I'm teetering with this decision. So I think to um, make me lighten up, um, everyone started being really silly that they wouldn't give me the information. So they're like zipping their lips closed. They're like throwing away the key. They're putting duct tape. So I start laughing at that point because it really was funny. How everyone was pantomiming that they love me and support me, but just couldn't tell me more. I was going to need to figure it out myself. And Michael then asks me, what do you want to do? The moment he asks me that, this panoramic screen, like being at the, the IMAX theater with the 70 foot screen that just fills your world. All I can see is my daughter Tara's face, her adorable little toddler face and her brown curly hair. That's all I can see and her smiling. And I know I can go back and be the mother to this amazing little girl. I know I'm gonna regain my health. And I know I'm going to have another healthy child. So I said, put me back in coach. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ready to play. I'm ready to go back. At that point, they gave me a second hug. The first, when I'd immediately gotten up there, they'd given me this huge hug. And that was where I'd felt that unconditional love. And I realized I had not felt very much of that. And it's a really big deal. And it's something we have to be able to give to ourselves and to be able to give to others. I think if we can change that, that's going to help bring peace in the world. So 
the second time when I've said I want to go back and they give me this huge group hug again, I caught on. It wasn't just love that time. They were giving me this tremendous energy download because I was flatter than a pancake. Remember, I couldn't even walk through a tunnel to get home. I'd had to have that assist to even get home. So they give me this beautiful energy download. I don't think I would have made it through the surgery otherwise without this um, blissful, amazing trip home. And everyone then just, you know, starts waving and says, you know, you can do it. They turn into cheerleaders and I just wave and I go back down the escalator, you know, looking over my shoulder. I don't have any regrets. I felt so respected that I got to make the decision because I hear a lot of people say, oh, I feel like I was told you have to go back. It's not your time. Or they feel even like they were shoved back into their body. I didn't have that experience. It was very, it, it really honored my free will. It was very, very respectful and loving, but so supportive. So I go back down the escalator, the, the light above me, it just closes out. And I just go right back into my body. It's just that simple. It's just that easy. And I'm just back in my body. I do have a successful surgery the next morning. And I'm, I rest in the hospital, recover for about three days. I'm sent home for six weeks of bed rest. And that goes very well. We were very fortunate we had the live-in nanny because she's taking care of not only our daughter, she's taking care of me because I was weak as a kitten. I could only walk um, the stairs in the two-story house once a day, and it would take me about 10 minutes <laughs> to get up and down the stairs because the, all the bedrooms were upstairs. So I just made my one trip a day, and that was, that was it. I go back to work. I return to a job I love, went part-time for a week or two, and then back to full-time. And everyone is so lovely and supportive at work, but they're like, Wendy, how are you? What happened? And I would just look at them. I'm like, I don't even know how to verbalize this. This is just, this is not like quick hallway conversation in a busy ophthalmology practice. <laughs> it's just, it was, it was so hard. I didn't know who to talk to about it. The irony of not knowing about IANS when IANS Seattle is the oldest chapter in the country in Seattle. And here I was in Seattle, but I just, I didn't know about it. So Evidently, I was meant to figure it out and work it out on my own. That took me about 20 years to do, um, to process everything that had happened. And the angels were absolutely right with everything that they said, even though some of it took years to come true. What happened um, after I'm back to work, everything's going great, is at six weeks in, I am laid off very upsetting layoff, even though it was done with as much kindness and compassion as possible. I now don't have a job that we very much count on. Don't forget I'm pregnant. This is not the ideal time to be out looking. I also carry the health insurance for the entire family. So we now have no health insurance for my delivery. And one week later, after I'm laid off, and this is the fall of 19. 97. And some of you will re remember the country went into, the U.S. went into a very deep recession at that time. But, you know, we didn't know. We didn't know that's what was coming. One week later, my husband comes home from work hours late. He'd not called. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on? There must be terrible traffic. You know, I hope he hasn't been in a fender bender. This is just, this is just odd. So he gets home about eight o'clock at night walks in the door looking like weight of the world on his shoulders and says, I have something really hard to tell you. You need to sit down. He had been running a very successful software company with four partners. They employed about 100 people and they had gone uh, belly up very, very quickly. I had not known there were any issues at all. It just really... Um, became problematic. They'd laid off almost everyone in the company. And what he let me know was he was going to be working incredibly long hours. He was going to have to do programming himself because they had sold contracts and he didn't feel right not fulfilling those contracts and also didn't want to lose his reputation uh, in the industry and, and have you know future um, employment, employment problems. 
So he's going to be working crazy long hours for payless payday. And when he said to me, I'm going to be on payless paydays, I'm going like, does not compute. Those two words don't go together. And I tried to take a breath and be as compassionate as I could, because it's one thing to be laid off from a job you love. It's another thing to lose your own company, to lose your own baby you've worked on for years. So I'm trying to be compassionate about that. And I said, well, just take a breath, take the weekend, we'll figure it out. You know, on Monday, you can file for unemployment. That's the next shocker. I was like, Wendy, I don't, I don't qualify for unemployment. I'm self-employed. I'd never been self-employed, so I didn't, I didn't know that. So we're now down literally to my unemployment only with the family of four. The nanny's on contract. We can't let her go. Heavily mortgaged. We'd bought a larger home with the second baby coming. We had just bought a new minivan, new baby coming. So um, the angels were right when they said things were going to get going to get very challenging. So we did make it through. Uh, Grace of God and Bank of Mom um, helped us out um, because we had tried doing everything um, to just uh, you know manage the finances. We'd used up our savings and credit card, um, et cetera. And uh, my mother uh, kindly stepped to the plate and loaned us the amount we were short each month. So we did not lose our house. We did not lose our van because both were in danger of being taken from us. So it really was um, a, a big deal and so, so grateful to her. And what, what happened next was uh, my husband was able to get his company purchased. He did get back to work. Our astrology, there must have been some planetary and personal astrology going on because he went back to work. Our daughter is born uh, March 13th, 1998, and he, on a Friday, he goes back to work into the new company that's purchased their company on Monday. So literally in a weekend, everything shifts and the beautiful, healthy baby is born and he's back to work. And we agreed I was going to take a three-month maternity leave um, and start um, uh, looking for a position, um, you know, two months or so in, and then I would then go back to work. And that's exactly what did happen. But Michael came back in, Archangel Michael. I had a very short stay in the hospital. It was uh, what they called drive-through deliveries where I was approved. I was able to get health insurance, even though neither of us was working. Again, that was divine intervention. Um, and I heard, I'm sitting in the pediatrician's office, really stressed because um, I'm probably maybe six months pregnant by that time. And I'm sitting in the um, a pediatrician's office waiting for our name to be called. And I hear Archangel Michael say, look, look. And I look over I'm like, oh gosh, is you know, a child gonna fall or are they gonna you know, pull a table over? What's happening here? What he was showing me was this brochure that was in the corner of the room on a little side table and had a lamp above it. And again, it was like that divine light came in and lit it up. And I'm like, gosh, what is that brochure? So I ran over there and grabbed it and stuffed it in the diaper bag. And when I got home and read it, it was um, a program called WIP, Women, Infants, and Children. And bottom line, I was able to um, get some qualifying, get some healthy food for us, as well as health insurance because neither of us was working, but we owned a home. So that was keeping us from qualifying for most aid programs, but we did qualify for that one. So I've been approved for this very short hospital stay, um, 24 hours, including labor. Um, and uh, you know, I'm on home the next day, so grateful. Anyone is grateful to be holding their newborn, but with what I had been through, multiply that by about a thousand times. I am holding her. I've been home about an hour and I'm looking down at, at her and I hear Archangel Michael say pretty sternly, your contract with your husband is complete. I almost dropped the baby because I'm like, what the heck? Can I even catch my breath here? I am not even barely home and you're telling me my marriage is over? And I'm clarifying, I'm trying to talk with Michael. I didn't know how to meditate at the time. I was shocked that I got these clear messages. I mean, they were clear as day. I knew they were correct. 
and I could just hear them and feel them. Doesn't mean I always liked the message, but I knew it was accurate and clear. So I found out later my soul contract with my former husband was to have a long-term marriage that we both learned from and to have beautiful children together. Children, plural, there's the second baby. So we did everything we could to be respectful, um, spouses, co-parents, et cetera, but we did divorce um, when the, the children started school full-time. I chose that was the best time um, to do it. So that was one uh, very interesting soul contract. And you know, then reinventing life again, because two homes, the kids going back and forth, what are we gonna do for housing? How do we divide assets? And how do we be just really peaceful uh, co-parents together? Um, so we did, we did do that. We did do that long haul. Um, and because their children were only six and eight at the time. And we did it right through, right through them being in college. Um, what started to get, um, really get the spiritual awakening going was about six years after the divorce, everything was going well. I'd completely rebuilt my life had a great career going again. My daughters were doing great. They were early teens, 12 and 14. Um, I had been able to build a wonderful um, duplex with my mother. She's living next door. She helps with the kids. I mean, everything was really, really going well. And that was the point where I took a breath and said, gosh, what's next? And I realized I'm ready to meet a great guy. Um, and I wasn't sure how to do that. So I asked, I asked some younger girlfriends and they're like, oh, Wendy, you just need to go on match.com. I'm like, match.what? Because I have no idea what on online dating is. I do go on to match.com. Um, girlfriends helped me put this profile together. And there, I think the most important soul contract of my life came up. And I met the gentleman on match who had the sole contract to wake me up spiritually. He introduces me to Journey of Souls by Dr. Michael Newton. I devour it. I know everything is absolutely resonating highly for me. I'm starting to make sense of the near-death experience and everything that's happened is making so much more sense to me. And he and I um, date for just a little over a year. And I am devastated when that ends because I really thought this was the one, but I did not understand at that time, we had a bolus of past life energy to shift and that leads into the archetypes, which I will, I will get to. But over um, several years work, I was able to do enough of my own energy healing and learned how to meditate, learned how to pray much more meaningfully uh, became a Reiki master energy healer, became a certified spiritual teacher. And I'm doing all this while I'm working the full-time day job, uh, raising my daughters and, uh, and it's starting to shift to the point where I'm starting to help, help my mom. Um, and so it just was incredibly, incredibly busy. So with that soulmate that woke me up that I met via match, um, we found 21 lives together, as Robert said in the introduction. That was shocking to me. I had no idea you could choose to incarnate with someone that many times. But if you're learning lessons really well with someone, they can be very important and that can absolutely be true. And I'm at the point now, um, I've been finding my past lives since 20. Uh, 11 was when the first two came through via a session with the Michael Newton therapist. And I've now found and worked with and healed and celebrated and cried over and laughed at um, about 150 of them. I, I just, I don't even count anymore at this point. <laughs> so let's jump into past life archetypes. So it's just that strong energy. It's that, that collection of energy and the point is past life, uh, past lives can be impacting you now in ways that you're not aware of. And it's important to start to realize and understand why did you bring the energy from those specific lives to your present life um, and to be able to heal it and release it so that you can enjoy a happier and healthier now. So what are the archetypes? So here's the big, here's the big reveal. Let's, let's uh, jump into those. So here's the fun, the fun curtains back. 
So here's some of the archetypes, and I'm not going to uh, go through them all in the interest of time, but happy to answer questions. I can't wait to uh, get to your questions, but just some examples. The ruler, um, the rebel, the explorer, uh, the victim, the merchant, the priest, or the priestess. There's just so many of these big archetypes that we do choose, because my belief is we choose our lives. We choose a lot of important things about them but then they do fall into these categories, so to speak, where there's a certain type of energy. I cannot tell you how many monks and nuns uh, I have worked with, and sometimes priests or priestesses, who've taken vows of poverty, and it's impacting them now. And they can't fully live their life now that they intended or meant to because they're still stuck in that old vow of poverty that was very appropriate at that time. But guess what? They had a roof over their head. They had food. They had clothing. And now we're in a different system. Uh, you know, welcome to capitalism. So it's just a different, it's a different system. So being able to help people let go of that energy that's not serving them anymore, it can improve their health, their wealth, their harmonious relationships. It really changes things. And then when we start to figure out the patterns, because often we have groupings of these past lives, because we don't master things like forgiveness or gratitude or boundaries. We don't master those in a single life. You, the soul just craves those experiences, as I said, in order to progress. So we look at everything from every angle. One time we're the ruler, another time we're the peasant, another time, um, you know, there's just so many different roles. So we look at it from different ways. So Let's get into a specific um, example. One of the lives where I had the most energy uh, to clean up and clear uh, was um, from Plymouth Plantations, was Colonial America, uh, 13, thir um, 13, excuse me, 1600s. And Anne Warren um, was my maiden name and uh, eventually married Thomas Little. But look at the sketch in the upper left, just looking um, sad, looking kind of ghostly, <laughs> just uh, a lot of energy, not, not a lot of energy there. So um, she is a great example of just a very loving, really cared about and wanted that romantic partner so much. I would call her the jilted lover. So not just the lover archetype, but she ends up becoming the jilted lover. And she actually becomes um, a ghost. And that's a big deal to resolve that energy. So the, the background to this is Richard Warren comes over on the original Mayflower in 1620. He sends for his wife and five daughters. And I was the second of the five daughters. We come over on the Anne in 1623. And the minute I, as Anne Warren, see Captain William Pierce, I see the ship's master and I'm like, I know him, I know him, I know him. And I recognized him as primary soulmate was what I was feeling. But I'm just a 12 year old girl, very sheltered, very naive. Don't forget, this is, you know, Puritans. This is, this is a different era. But I'm seeing, you know, this, this young, robust, you know, late 20s type captain and thinking, I know him. What is going on here? And uh, William Pierce is a, a famous historical figure. He was known for successfully, uh, he became known as the ferryman of the North. He brought more people over from England and from Europe to, um, to the U.S., both to uh, Virginia and to Massachusetts than any other ship's captain. Uh, this became my second book um, because there was so much energy um, to release because what happens is as Anne gets a little older and as she is living at Plymouth Plantation with her family, William Pierce comes back and visits from time to time and it turns into a clandestine romance. Again, naive um, young girl in love with an inappropriate, <laughs> unsuitable older man, and he's encouraging it. He's loving the attention, and this should not be going on. So this is, this is what's happening that's kind of setting, setting the stage. So Abby Metcalf was my best 
friend. She was wise beyond her years. She is one of my best friends again now. She's what I would call a sage, just so centered, so uh, wise and loving. And I did have, as Ann Warren, I did go out on one of these carriage rides where a suitor came and asked permission of my parents, could he take me out on a courting ride? And here is his sketch. His name was John Hotman, and I enjoyed the carriage ride, but I knew he was not the right man for me. So it literally ends with one kiss, and that's it. Takes me back home. I turn him down. I say, no, thank you. You know, thank you so much for the attention and the, you know, your interest, but I am not, I am not interested in marrying you. Shockingly, his name is one letter off my former husband's name. And it's the same man. And when Lori Regan, who I became friends with, drew this sketch, she'd never met John. She barely knew me when she drew that first sketch. And then these other sketches started coming through. She didn't know who they belonged to. She posted them on Facebook, said, I hope somebody knows who these are. And I was claiming them sketch after sketch. These sketches are not about how fancy the art is. She draws these in 10 minutes, zero training. It's an energy release. It's about the energy, but it's, it's a pretty darn good likeness of my former husband. It's a pretty darn good likeness of, of um, my friend. It's amazing. Three of them, I don't carry, I don't think the looks as much, but very, very interesting how this can occur, that these gifted people can draw these sketches to help you release and let go of that past life energy. I die um, as Anne Warren very suddenly, 1675, it's King Philip's War. Um, and what had happened was um, Captain William Pierce had ghosted me. He had just disappeared about five years into this clandestine relationship. I am totally in love with them. And he had said, wait for me, Anne, you're so special, I'll be back for you. So I think he's gonna ask for my hand in marriage. Instead, he disappears. Takes me a couple years to pull myself together. Uh, my sister, older sister, really helped. My stepmother really helped. My father was um, dead. Um, my father died the same year um, that William disappeared. So it does not help. I've like lost the two most important males in my life as a teenager. Um, but I do, I do heal enough to marry a very wonderful, suitable man and have a big family. And the grandkids are coming, and you know things get get great, great. But I die very suddenly in my 60s. I was a, a widow um, and I go down Indian Arrow in the left side and I didn't know it was coming. Um, and that's rife for a ghost with this sudden death and a lot of emotion. So I don't cross over. Everyone comes in, asks me to cross over. And I say, no, I'm waiting for William because William said he'd come back for me. And he never came back. So I'm just too literal, too literal. <laughs> I just needed to go home. I just needed to go up to the light, but I didn't do it. So I became a ghost for 300 plus years. Came back multiple times to try and get myself home. Um, I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't know you could reincarnate again, but because we've got so much energy as the higher self, some of it's at home. And when you get experienced with incarnating, you can incarnate into multiple, um, multiple bodies because you want to, you want to learn more and you want to be moving it along. So you can do that when you get efficient with your energy. So I've died in 1675, refusing to go home. And fast forward into my present life, I meet and marry my um, husband in 1989. We have the good fortune to purchase our first home a few months after our wedding. And we purchased this large colonial in Boxford, north of Boston. Plymouth is south of Boston. I'm right back in the same area. And I am, I will admit, this dewy-eyed romantic. I just am so over the moon to be married and that we've bought the first house. It's the same energy, it's the same personality um, as Anne Warren. 
My husband um, was traveling extensively for business. He was away um, on the road, out of town, out of state, 50 to 75% of the time. So, um, you know, I'm home. And what happens is this ghost starts coming to me. Originally scares the bejesus out of me because I don't know what's happening. And I hear these footsteps um, coming up the stairs. And I think someone's broken into the house. And it takes me a while to realize, oh my gosh, it's actually a ghost. I can see this heartbroken young woman from colonial America by the clothing um, I could date when it was. And she just keeps looking toward the water. She keeps climbing up on this huge rock, looking toward the water. And she's heartbroken because her beloved doesn't come back for her. So that was Anne Warren and Captain William Pierce. But I'm now feeling it hundreds of years later in present day. And I don't know what the heck's going on. <laughs> I can't make heads or tails of this. I'm an MBA, I'm 28 years old. I know nothing about energy. I know nothing about psychic abilities. I don't meditate. I don't have a spiritual practice. I don't know what the heck's going on. So I try and share this experience with my husband and he just kind of looks at me and says, come on, Wendy, get a grip. You've got to get comfortable being home alone, you know, when I'm gone this much, you know, we chose to buy this house, you knew I was traveling, like, yeah, I'm fine with all that, but I don't understand what, what's happening. Two different people um, came and stayed in our home in the three and a half years we lived there, and they helped me so much, because when I asked my cousin, and when I asked uh, my best friend from um, back when I was 18 and had started college, how'd you sleep, you know, just hostess question, you need any more blankets, need any more towels? Both of them took me aside separately, different times they stayed with us and said, you won't believe the dream I had last night. There's this heartbroken young woman from colonial America stuck on your property. She keeps climbing this huge rock looking for her beloved and he's not going to come back for her. She's stuck. And I'm like, wait a minute. How are they dreaming the same dream? I never told them about the dream. So that was helping me understand something was really going on um, energetically that I needed to clean up. But we moved. Um, we, yeah, I thanked them for telling me. Um, and we just, we didn't know what to make of it. So we moved from the home in 1993. Uh, we moved out to Seattle. So I've now moved across the country. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what to do with it. I wanted to help this heartbroken young woman, but I didn't know how to help her. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know the concept of, you know, invite her up to the light, call angels in for her, tell her you don't have a body, you need to go home. Uh, you know, tell her she's loved, she's welcome at home. I didn't know to do any of that. So we, we move, we're out in Seattle and I just shove, I just shove it away. Um, I don't know what to do with it. So 20 years pass. My, um, my best friend, um, um, Abby, um, using her Plymouth Plantation name, um, she suddenly has this very interesting experience with a ghost that she cannot get out of her house. And she manages to clear it, but says she was almost sucked into the heartbreak energy was so strong. So she tells me about this on the phone um, the next day. And she'd started the conversation by saying, are you sitting down? Which she'd never said to me before. And I was like, okay, I better sit down. I could just feel chills all over my body and my guides were coming in and they were saying, get ready to hear deep truth. This is a breakthrough moment for you. You're going to be able to do some massive cleanup that you need to do energetically. So I'm like, oh, I am all ears. So she tells me about clearing this heartbroken young colonial American woman from her house in Redmond, Washington, 20 years after I've moved from Boston and had all those ghost experiences, I had never told her about the experiences. And the punchline was, she says to me, I'm not sure I got the ghost to the light because you're meant to do it because that ghost is you. So that's how I learned that of what had really been going on. So I thanked her for telling me and pieces started coming into play more quickly then because I could start to make sense of it. I recognized that boyfriend who had the soul contract that woke me up spiritually. I recognized he was Captain William Pierce. 
I'm like, of course, we came back together again and had to meet together again because I was still so angry, so heartbroken, so confused because I never got closure in that lifetime. And evidently I like closure. I like things to be tidy. So um, he and I did, and we were no longer dating. I give him great credit because I explained to him, I spent months meditating, doing healing sessions, doing historical research, sorting all out what had happened. And I presented it to him and told him in about an hour over dinner. And I give him great credit. Again, this is ex-girlfriend presenting this crazy story to you of we have energy from the 1600s to clean up. Will you help me? Are you on board or not? Because you're part of what caused it to happen. So he just looked at me and said, I am so sorry. Absolutely. I can't follow all of this, but I know it's absolutely deep truth. I know you're a hundred percent right. And just tell me what to do. How can I help you? We both need to make this right. So we did um, a ritual and a ceremony. I'd never done one before uh, in this lifetime, but we, we called in that past life energy. Um, and we called in Anne and William and it, it was palpable. It was the four of us in the room. And we told them and explained what had happened and we sent her up to the light um, after, after William apologized to her. Cause she, she wanted that apology. <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't going to um, take any prisoners on that. So she did, she did get that apology. The energy was um, hell hath or um, hell hath. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so blanking on that expression. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. That's what it was. It was a lot of heartbreak, but there's a lot of anger to it too. So, and it was absolutely impacting all my relationships with men. It was causing problems. <laughs> so um, I was able to get it fully cleaned up via um, 2011 uh, past life regression, because of course it was Anne that came right through. I didn't ask a single question about her and came through. And I spoke as Anne Warren for over an hour. And the details, the hypnotherapist was so good. She was asking, well, how did you make your houses and blah, blah, blah. And how did you grow the food? And she asked all these questions that I as Wendy have no idea. I never studied that time period very well. I had no idea, but I had the recording and I transcribed it all. And then I looked it all up and it was like amazing um, of how historically accurate it appeared to be, but, but the emotion to it and the day-to-day -day living of it was pretty incredible. So that's, that's what happened. And so again, that's the lover archetype. Oh, but boy, that one was, that was a tough one. Here's an example of the rebel. Uh, this is honestly my favorite past life. And I found a past life um, as Emma Stortebecker, uh, who is a North Seas pirate, a different friend who is also a past life sketch artist. I have been blessed with those. Most people don't have sketches of their past lives like this, but she did this amazing sketch. I told her nothing about that life because you don't want to influence um, the person. And I just had said to her at one point, um, you know, I'd like to have you do a past life sketch for me. And she immediately, and it's, it's large, it's 11 by 14, this sketch. And who um, Emma was and how she first presented, it came up in a Reiki healing session. So I went and was having a beautiful Reiki session. I'm just laying on the table and, you know, had that. But the Reiki master I worked with, he's wonderful. I actually worked with him in my full-time day job too, but I knew he did Reiki. I had never had a Reiki session. It sounded intriguing. I said, I'd like to go for a healing session. So I made the appointment and went to his house on the weekend. But at the end of it, when I'm sitting up and just, you know, just take a minute, you know, sit on the edge of the table, just kind of get your orientation. And I'm like, oh, what is that? And I started getting this spontaneous past life recall. And he did the same thing. And he's like, oh my gosh, what is that? And he said, Wendy, because he's also a psychic medium. And he said, Wendy, is it okay if I share a past life impression with you? I'm like, oh yeah, tell me about it, please, because I think I'm right there with you. And it was so powerful because we were visioning it together. And 
what we um, discovered, and we were just both narrating it back and forth. Um, I had married um, Klaus Stortebecker. By the way, these are nom de guerre. These are, we, we, we changed our names um, uh, because you don't want your identity known. We were North Seas, what's called victuals um, or Robin Hood pirates. People were starving. It was time of war. Um, this was the uh, late 1300s, early 1400s. Governments were corrupt. Um, and we um, were darn good at, um, shall I say, liberating food. And we would um, distribute it to the people either for free or for very affordable prices. And we had a darn fine time. <laughs> because to get to be a pirate, but to get to be doing good <laughs> at the same time, it was like double win. <laughs> so it was, it was amazing. So I just had this incredible experience with the Reiki healing and learning about this life. And then I'm driving home going, wow, is this just being fanciful? You know, it's a common archetype. Doesn't everyone want to be a pirate? There's so many people dress up as pirates for Halloween. It's like a very free type of energy. And, but when I got home, my, my guide said, we need to show you proof because you're one of those people that likes validation. So they showed me several things, including they said, go Google well-known North Seas pirates, because I didn't know my name at the time that hadn't you know, come in yet. I didn't know the time period. And I'm like, well-known North Seas pirates. I'm going, where's the North Seas? <laughs> it's not going to history or geography. So when this stuff comes into me and I'm told my guides say to Google it, I do. I don't normally, I don't go on fishing trips because I don't want to contaminate my own process and my own meditation and energy of landing this. So I write it down. But they said, Google it. And they also said, you'll find your husband and you'll know the photo is wrong. I'm like, okay. So I immediately found him in that listing and I included that link. And that's how I knew his name was Klaus. And then I was able to meditate another day. And I said, what was my name? Um, and that's how, you know, that's how that came in. And that's how some of that history started to come in. Um, but um, there was some energy to relief because there was some, there was some heartbreak, there was some violence from it. And I saw my uh, beloved husband, I saw um, Klaus um, be beheaded. Um, he was caught, come on, we're pirates. <laughs> this is not a long-term engagement usually. So he's caught um, in his early forties. My sister and I were not on board the ship, but he and our whole crew are caught and they are beheaded um, in Hamburg Square in 1401. And everyone is rounded up and told, you're supposed to be at the town square. You're supposed to be there for the beheadings because the government wants to make a statement of, hey, this is what happens if you're going to be a pirate or whatever other punishment. So everyone has to be there. We stood as far away as possible because this is horrible. I cannot describe what that's like to have to watch. So we're all the way, uh, we had our backs pressed up against a store was like behind us because, you know, we want to send love and support, but I didn't need to be close to that. So Klaus and everyone, including my sister's husband, it's all, it's all, it's everyone to us. It's our family. It's our best friends. There's only my sister and I left. So um, I cried out and that caught the authorities' attention. And the shopkeeper came out and grabbed my sister and I and said, you better go out the back door now, run. So we ran because we gave ourselves away because I'm sure we were already suspected as being part of that crew. I met that friend again now. So it's just amazing how people come back again. I do recover. Um, years later, I marry um, Steve Rumfeld, um, another, another pirate. And I remet me as the present day Emma. I remet Klaus um, in, in 2010. He again um, is that same soulmate who woke me up spiritually that I met via match. But for there, it was heartbreak energy. I needed to release heartbreak regarding a spouse. So again, you can kind of see this, you know, jilted lover. It's like, oh, we've got to be cleaning this up because now there's the heartbreak over the husband that's been killed. 
and it happened twice in that life. But hey, I chose the life. It is still my favorite life. Interestingly, I re-met Steve, and Steve is who's pictured here on the right. Um, again, the sketches by um, Marjorie um, O'Mara. I re-met Steve um, just this year, just a couple months ago. But we had some we had some energy to release, so we we dated for a couple months. Great guy, um, but we it was it was an energy release needed to happen. Um, and I had this sketch done for him for his birthday um, and the relationship ended just before his birthday. So I ended up with a pair of sketches from that life. It was meant to, meant to stay with me evidently. Um, and with, with Steve again, it was just um, having to go through um, losing, losing your spouse to violence like that. I was spared that time because I was visibly pregnant and just no one was gonna, we had a pregnant woman. So that's why I survived that time. So I survived, I survived twice in that lifetime. Unusual. So um, moving on from that, got those energy releases done. What came through as I was literally driving home from that life-changing first ever Reiki session where a past life also came through. As I was literally driving home, my guide said, now that you've accepted, past life as the pirate queen, we need to tell you about another life as a queen where you have so much energy you need to release. I literally had to pull over. I had to pull into the parking lot. I'm like, I cannot safely drive like this with so much download coming to me. So I just pulled over and just sat in the parking lot and finally pulled out a notebook out of my glove box and started writing down what my guides were saying. And I'm like, Queen Guinevere, really? Come on, um, this is hard to take. Uh, I, I just was questioning, is this fantasy? Is this unbalanced ego? I was really highly suspicious of it. But so much information kept, kept coming through. So I wrote it all down. I typed it all up. Um, multiple confirmations kept coming up. It just would not stop coming. <laughs> The energy kept coming to me, more information. So I was like, gosh, I need to do a past life regression as the client. So I did. It ended up being multiple past life regressions with different therapists, because I even would purposefully change therapists because I didn't want them to get starstruck around Arthur and Guinevere and Camelot and the round table. And I didn't want to influence them. And I never said, hey, I want to check if I have a past life as Guinevere. I was just like, whatever energy needs to come through. And it was multiple um, past life regressions with me as the client, with Guinevere and different therapists. And they all did a great job of asking a lot of detailed questions. And I started to realize how many people I re-met now in my present life that I recognized from that lifetime because there was energy to release there were things, there were good things about it too. There was a lot of things to um, embrace and it showed me caretaking, you know, not only people in the castle, but the villages and the community. It just showed me a lot of um, things about, about strategy and taking care of, of the masses even. It was really, really fascinating. I re-met Arthur. Arthur, no surprise, is the same soul that woke me up spiritually. So what a role um, he's had um, is kind of a common thread um, that he was William Pierce. Um, he was also King Arthur. Um, so just these multiple, multiple lives. I re-met Merlin. Uh, Merlin was Guinevere's teacher um, and best friend as well as Arthur. So that was pretty amazing. Merlin's now a female and she was able to help uh, fill in some blanks on that. I made a pilgrimage out to Glastonbury. My guides had been telling me for years, you need to go up to Glastonbury in England. You need to make a past life pilgrimage. There's two key past lives there. I finally got there um, and um, went out there. Oh, I'm sorry, I put the wrong year. It was not um, 2010, it was 2019, uh, just before COVID. And I had this tremendous healing of my left knee, my left leg, and my left foot um, from a past life injury where that had been blown off um, in wartime when I stepped on a bomb. And imagine going through your life energetically, it's still impacting me now. It was like I didn't have a leg to stand on. I couldn't catch my balance. 
And I also was very hard to receive because I didn't have my left leg and left foot. So energetically, and <laughs> anatomically it's there. So I came back and things just started to turn around um, remarkably and I could more live my purpose. But uh, Guinevere had a lot of things to clean up. There was so much jealousy of her. She was an unusually powerful, uh, brilliant, um, highly, uh, highly trained in strategy and military strategy, highly educated all by her father. Um, and there were a lot of um, women in particular that were extremely jealous of this young queen. So I had to resolve that with many, many people. A betrayal energy came up um, hugely with men and men would tell me, I can't trust you. I would have um, someone I was dating or a boyfriend or my husband. And I am very trustworthy in this lifetime, but they were sensing that old betrayal energy of, because Guinevere did, did betray um, Arthur and she cuckolded him and she had an affair with Lancelot, who was Arthur's best friend. So that's even more painful. And that was uh, really what, um, what, what ended um, Camelot in, in many ways. And just some repeated lessons were, were coming up about uh, just being an in integrity and just releasing um, that heartbreak and heartbreaker energy. Because I came forward this lifetime with a lot of karma as a heartbreaker. Most of it was from um, Guinevere. Um, so, and I already told you the link between, um, Arthur and, and William Pierce, and it's just all been, uh, that same, that same soulmate. So as we continue this, uh, journey through time, let's get more local as well as more, um, current day. Uh, the creative is a, a wonderful archetype, whether it's your artist, your writer, your photographer, it can be a person that's creative in business or in healing, whatever it is but I found a past life. It's actually a friend found this shared past life where I was part of a writing couple. I was married to someone that was also a writer and she was part of um, a writing couple. So she first found it, but I, I validated it all. And when I was, so she told me about it and I'm thinking, gosh, that's, that's amazing that we might've had this past life, but I worked to vet it all. I worked to meditate, ask my guides, is this true? Then please show me proof, show me validation. And my guide said, ask your friend, ask her if she can figure out what your husband's name was in that lifetime. She'd not mentioned it. And I'd already been told it in meditation. So, and I'd written it down and she was able to come up with it. And when she said John Elliott to me, I said, that's not only correct, it's a double validation because yes, that was my husband in the 1800s, but it's my grandfather's name in this lifetime. And she didn't know that. And that's what the guides were saying. They said, this one's fun because you're going you're gonna to know it's right because it's a double validation by the name. So this wonderful life was meant to be, quote, a rest life. Um, and there weren't going to be any major challenges. The purpose was for me to resolve what had become a karmic pattern of ghosting of I wasn't going home after too many of my lifetimes. And that is not cool. <laughs> it's just not cool to have a karmic pattern of this. We were gentlemen farmers. It was fairly easy to earn our living by growing our own food. We purposefully grew food on our small farm that was different than our next door neighbors who were our best friends who were also writers and we would trade. So we did the same thing at Plymouth. Um, so, you know, this is a common, this is a common strategy when you're growing your own food, um, grow, grow some things different than your neighbors. These things may become important again. So we were um, in Othello, which at the time was Oregon country and it's now part of Washington state. So I knew who my husband was in that lifetime. Again, that same um, gentleman who had the contract to wake me up. So here he is in all three of these lives that I'm detailing. And I asked he and the friend who had found um, the life, I said, hey, we can do a day trip out to Othello. I've never been there. Do you want to do a past life pilgrimage to learn more about that past life? And he said, yes. And she said, no. 
And she said, I'm supposed to stay home and be like a quality control check to you guys. I'm going to help validate. And you're going to come and we'll have a careful discussion after and see if what you found is true. And if what I found via meditating that day, we'll see if it syncs up. So that's what we did. We were trying to figure out, well, where do we actually live? We just knew we wanted to go to Othello. We didn't think we'd be able to find our farm, but we started at the local cemetery because we thought, let's see if we can even find our graves. Maybe there's graves there because we knew our names and it's not that Oh Wendy, God. sorry to interrupt. We are going to need you to wrap up Absolutely. in the next minute or two. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Yvonne. So we were able to find the actual farm. The friend was able to validate it. Um, and we found the farm because it's literally next door to, it's now private property, but it's still some farmland. It's literally next door to the cemetery where we started our search. So um, that's, that's what happened with that. So we will go through very quickly. How can we resolve past life energy, past life regression? Absolutely. Working directly with your higher self and guides, asking for assistance, meditating, prayer, your spiritual practice. These are the ways we release it. So, so important. And you'll feel so much better. It makes such a difference. Being out in nature absolutely helps us resolve our past lives. Journaling, auto writing, messages from your guides, doing dream analysis, muscle testing. And I know, um, you know, you may not be familiar with all these things. So certainly things I can help walk you through. You're so welcome to request a complimentary phone appointment with me at my website, which is wendyrosewilliams.com. And other ways, Akashic Records reading, uh, getting past life portraits and readings with them, like I've been showing you examples of. Working with a healer, but make sure it's a healer who's highly experienced with helping you heal past lives. You don't want it just narrated. You don't want to be told, oh goodness, you might have been a pirate and you saw your husband beheaded. And then you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do with that? So, and also practicing trust, forgiveness, gratitude, just being, you know, the best of ourselves really helps us get where we need to be. Here is the screen you might want to take a picture of um, with your phone, um, with my contact information, website, um, I also have a podcast, as uh, Robert mentioned, Waking Up Spiritually, and it's all archived at wakingupspiritually.com with lots of good descriptions. And my author page is here. And thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to hear your questions. So get a picture of this because I'm going to stop screen sharing so we can move to uh, Q&A. Thank you so much. Wendy, that was great. You know, the first question um, I have is about what you said, you just have to be willing to try. That was a part of your original story. And I found it so fascinating. Tell us what that means to you. When Archangel Michael said that to me, because I mean, I was literally laying on my side, bleeding out at home alone and just feeling that love and that support and just that concept of to just be willing to try and it will get this divine assistance. And, I mean, cause I could have, I could have not woken up. Uh, you know, I, I just, I'm so fortunate that that happened and gave me an entire new lease on life and got me on my path and just changed everything. But it was so literal because my belief is that our guides and angels and the divine can't help us if we do not ask for help, if we're not willing to ask for help and receive the help, because this is a free will planet. We can choose to just nose to the grindstone. I'm going to stumble through life and be so independent and do the best I can. And I'm never going to ask for help or receive help. We can choose to do that. I mean, it's, it's a very instructive choice, but it's not going to be um, easy or fun. And you're not going to, in my opinion, you're, you're not likely to be able to really live your purpose and, and do what you came here to do if you're going to be in that place. And that's what I was doing for many, many years. <laughs> 
Thank you. That was um, that was a real key for me in your story. Um, the fact that you couldn't walk to the phone and that you were told you just have to be willing to try. I was fascinated by that because if we apply that to many aspects of our lives right now, it doesn't even mean we have to be able to achieve what we're after. We just have to you know, pull ourselves across the floor as you did by exactly. whatever means we can. And that is so liberating and encouraging. So thank you for that. I loved it. Um, <clears throat> We have a question here. I was fascinated by your statement that we can be incarnated in more than one lifetime at a time. Have you had overlapping incarnations? Tell us about that. Yes, I have. I was very surprised. I did not understand this concept at first. It took me a while to understand that our souls are so magnificent and so much energy. So my belief is there's a portion of our higher self of our soul it's always at home, always up with the light, whatever your belief system is, you know, heaven, nirvana, God, whatever your belief system is, I believe there's always a part of us there, but I believe we can really be working to pull that higher self into our body and, and, you know, to really be here now and be the best of us now, because why do I want to have my higher self, the best of me be so divorced, so separate from me? So I literally work to bring that into my body every day and to get wonderfully grounded to be on the planet. And what I've learned uh, over the last 10, 12 years of doing this work is experienced souls can sometimes choose. I believe we pre-life plan. So we're at home, we're in our pure soul form, and we're planning our next life, wherever that might be, on planet, off planet, any dimension. We're planning our next life and we're like, oh goodness, I want to work on these lessons. I know I need to get better at forgiveness. I know I need to get better at whatever it might be. And we can choose the life and do the planning for it. And I believe they're carefully planned with, with guides, with loving elders, as well as with soul family and people who are going to play important roles in it. Because if you think of it as a play, you know, you've, you've got to get, you've got to get your casting right. <laughs> of who's gonna be the Arthur for that Guinevere or whatever it might be. And we, we then can you know, have that, that whole play run going. And let's say we took, just as an example, let's say we took 20% of our energy with us to that life. So, cause we're experienced. We don't need to take you know, 85% of it with us. We, we know how to do this because we've incarnated many times. So our higher selves, you know, at home, still got 80% of the energy. That life's going along just as it should be with that 20%. And then the higher self's like, hmm, pretty ambitious. I could do more. <laughs> and can choose a life. Often they have a lot of contrast. So I did have a contrast life because as Gretchen Elliott, I'm never published. I write 50 books, 50 novels. I love it. It's great experience, but I only get to share them with my husband and our best friends next door. No one else ever reads them. We don't have children to leave them to. So those disappear in time, but I still have that experience. But there was a parallel life to that lifetime. Again, contrast where I was a single, I'm an unmarried writer other side of the country who has a lot of success and she earns a living from it and she becomes a household name and she's actually supporting her parents she's supporting her siblings she's supporting nieces and nephews so very different lives as the creative as a writer but it's a parallel life meaning the years overlap and it's the same soul it's me so I've still got um, energy at home is the higher self, that overarching, but I'm running that life as Gretchen Elliott, and another part of me is running that, that other lifetime as, as the well-known writer. So. Fascinating. <clears throat> I, I see there's another question here. I want to just answer this one quickly, because I wondered about that too. You only spoke of yourself as a female. Haven't you had past lives in which you are a male? Absolutely. I certainly have. Um, my belief is we incarnate male, female, gay, straight, 
fluid, anything and everything, wonderfully balanced, celibate, anything and everything. I chose these three lives simply because it pulled a thread with the one soulmate. He likes being male. I like being female, but I absolutely have had lives as males. That's a great question. He absolutely has had lives as females, but he doesn't have many of them. And he doesn't like to talk about them. This comes up in past life regression. It's, it's very interesting. I think it's just a, a, a psychology thing. When I'm working with a female, they are very likely to go to a past life as either female or a male. Males are much less likely to go to their female past lives. Mm -hmm. And I've asked other past life regressionists this, and we all see the same pattern. And that's fine, but it is a pattern. And maybe it's because they prefer being males, you know, so you go with what you want. Um, but have you had uh, past life memories of incarnating on other planets or other dimensions? I I've have. experience, and I wonder if you have. I have. I recall past lives on Venus, on uh, a water planet um, as a mermaid. I recall past lives on a planet that astronomers have not found yet called the Purple Planet. And Prince is on that planet. You think of Prince and all that beautiful purple, uh, purple rain. And it, it, the Purple Planet, its purpose is to beam violet flame energy to earth to help earth uplift and transmute and move out of this war and scarcity and these other interesting free will choices that we've made. Um, and I definitely remember other dimensions too. I know this may seem fanciful, but I so appreciate it. And so many validations have come up. So it's my reality. I've just got to own it. I remember the mermaid past lives fairies and dragons. There's quite a few dragons. And actually the dragon one, the, one of the dragon lives was a parallel life for both Guinevere and Arthur, where they were also dragons at the same time. Um, Arthur Pen Dragon. It's right there in the name. Mm, interesting. You know, you mentioned that sometimes people have taken a vow of poverty in another lifetime and that it's affecting them in this lifetime. Do you have any quick um, guidance on how people can uh, yes. alleviate that? Yes. Just tune into that. We all have self-limiting beliefs. Uh, money is just interesting uh, because it can be so, so loaded mm -hmm. and we can be, we can just be told, you know, money's the root of all evil and all these sorts of things that aren't, aren't true, but we can believe it's true and it can just become um, these self-limiting beliefs. So what you can do just sit down and just meditate, think clearly, just clear your mind and just write down what are some of my beliefs around money and just write them down. I think you will be shocked at some of the things that don't make sense that just kind of come out and then just look at them and say, I just, I'm ready to release this. Money is simply a tool to be used wisely. What if I could do fantastic philanthropy with, with this money and just attract um, a lot of funds? You know, if that's what your soul has planned, you may be meant that you're going to get the lottery win because you're going to know how to invest it and you're going to know how to set up foundations or get the advice to do that and are going to do some amazing things with it. Um, so it's not that um, that's one of the ways we can do it. That the phrase, that was then, this is now, is something that we use in past life regression, but you may be able to use it yourself if you're seeing that past life or you kind of sense it's past life energy or things you were told as a child. My grandfather, as a joke, used the term filthy lucre. Mm -hmm. I had to have multiple healing sessions to get that out of my energy field because I still had this aversion that money was bad, money was evil, that is not helpful. That is not useful because guess what? My soul chose and planned, I am meant to be a philanthropist. I have all the skills to know how to help large numbers of people. And I'm not gonna be on a pirate ship doing it and <laughs> stealing food. It's gonna be done a different way. 
Very good. You know, I think we're kind of at the end, but one quick question. Sometimes people say that receiving the information from past lives can be a distraction from the task that we have to achieve in this life. How do you respond to that? My response would be, ask your higher self and guides, what is your highest and holiest? What are you meant to know? We're not mm -hmm. going on an oddball fishing trip here. We're looking for things that needs to be released or embraced and celebrated. We're looking for things that support your life path, things that support your soul mission. So it's not, it's not a, a fishing trip. Perfect. I'm just, you know, casting out the net into, I want to find anything and everything. I was shocked and did not expect to be going through 150 plus lives. That is not, that is not typical, but I needed to fully open my Akashic records to be able to live my destiny and to live the life path and to do what I meant to do to help others. Very good. Thank you so much, Wendy. We really appreciate it today <clears throat> and appreciate your help. Well, thank you. It was my honor and privilege. And I, I love the great questions. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Wendy. That was absolutely fabulous. Incredibly fascinating. And I'm sure people are going to be watching this video again and again to um, absorb all the wonderful details that you uh, shared with us today. So thank you very much, Wendy.